We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. And I'm really excited about jumping into this new series with you if we haven't had a chance to meet yet. Uh, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor and uh, we're going to open up God's Word today. Uh, and that's what we do every Sunday. We teach out of this book because it's a life-changing book and it's how God chose to reveal a lot about himself to us. So grab a copy of God's Word and open it to the book of Ephesians. While you're doing that, I have a a really cool uh, announcement I want to share with you. Uh, We're experiencing such a a fun and rapid growth here at ACC that we're noticing that as our morning early service is getting out and this service is coming in, and as you guys leave today and the next service is coming, everyone's kind of on top of each other in the the lobby and the parking lot and the cafe. And so we've had some issues, even upstairs in our ACC kids, people kind of coming and going all at the same time. So what we've decided to do to make room for people to kind of come and go with a little bit more ease is we're going to adjust our service times just a little bit. It's not effective today. It's not going to be effective next Sunday. Next Sunday is going to be the same as it was today. But on June 4th, we're going to shift our service time. So our first service, which is normally at 8.30, we're going to change that back to 8.15. So that group will have to come here just about 15 minutes earlier. All right, for the 10 o'clock service, you all, uh, we're going to change your time to 10 o'clock. All right, so you're good. And the, eight, or the 11.30 service is going to shift to 11.45. And so we're just kind of giving another 15-minute buffer between our services. And we think that will provide a little bit of wiggle room as people are coming and going. Um, so that's going to be effective June 4th. Is that effective next week? No. That's right. You are listening. Good job. All right. So we're starting a brand new series today. We're going through the book of Ephesians together. Uh, how many of you in this room love a good mystery? How many of you, yeah, right? If you're picking something to watch, you like a good mystery. I have a habit of doing something. About halfway through a movie or halfway through a series that's a mystery, I like to try to figure out what the writers are going to do at the end, right? I want to try to solve the mystery before I'm supposed to solve the mystery. And so what I do so I don't spoil it for my family, if I think I know what's going to happen, I text myself the answer, as proof. So at the very end, I can say, I called it. I knew this was going to happen 40 minutes ago, right? Um, but I, I love a good mystery because I like to try to figure out the, the answer to the mystery. And one of the things that we're going to notice about the book of Ephesians is, is, is it's a, to understand, first of all, the book of Ephesians, we call it a book, but it's actually a letter, okay? It's a letter that the apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, and he wrote them this letter. And a couple things we should note about this letter. Number one is that this letter uh, written from Paul, uh, that Paul had a really genuine love for the church in Ephesus. He really deeply loved the people there. You actually see in the book of Acts, which is a story of the early church, right? That as Paul was in Ephesus, when, he was, when it was time to leave Ephesus and he was going on to the kind of the last stage of his missionary journey where he was going to be killed, that it says that he got together with the, the church in Ephesus and they wept bitterly together. He was sad to go because he loved these people. So know that, that this, this letter is written from a place of, of genuine love from Paul to the church in Ephesus. Another thing that you'll notice in the first couple verses of, the cha- of chapter 1 is that this letter was written to believers, all right? So this wasn't written to everybody. This letter was written specifically to those who have already made a decision to follow Jesus. So if you're in this room right now, and you are a follower of Christ, you've already placed your faith in him, I want you to understand that Paul's words apply to you. And now everybody can learn something from this. Maybe you're not sure about Jesus yet and you're in this room, I'm not saying to get up and leave. This isn't for you, right? That's not what I'm saying. 
I'm just saying you have to understand that when Paul says certain things, when he says that, that you have, uh, that you've been uh, bought, that you've been adopted into sonship, that you, this, that, and the other, these are words that apply only to people who've given their life to Jesus, all right? So understand that, secondly. But one of the things that you're going to find throughout this whole, the whole six chapters of this letter is that each chapter reveals an answer to a mystery. And so if you love a good mystery, you're going to love the book of Ephesians because Paul is essentially revealing a mystery. Remember the, um, the, there's a show on TV where there's a magician right? And he wears a mask, and he reveals how the magicians do their tricks. Have you guys ever seen that show before? I don't know about you, but at the end of a magic trick, the the thing that you know the magic trick was a great trick is if you're sitting there on the edge of your seat, and you're thinking, I have to know how you did that. Please tell me, right? If you go into a magic shop, they'll do a magic trick for you, and then you're sitting there thinking, I've got to know how you do that. And they're like, certainly, 40 bucks, right? (laughs) You know, you buy the answer, and we'll reveal it to you. We'll reveal the mystery to you. And so this guy on, on the television, right, he has a mask on because he doesn't want other magicians to know that he's the one selling out all their tricks, and it tells you the answer to the trick. Well, the book of Ephesians is, is going to be like that. Each chapter, we're going to reveal a mystery. The first one today is the mystery of God's will. All right, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1, and Paul is going to reveal to us through how, he's going to show us how God has revealed to us the mystery of his will. Let's look at that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse, we're going to start in verse 9. And it says this, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will. There it is right there. That's what we're going to talk about today. God has revealed to us, he's opened up our eyes to this thing called his will, and it is a mysterious will of God. It says, his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And then it it tells us what that plan is. Here's the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, again, this is for believers, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. So we read this, these three verses in Ephesians chapter 1, and we see something about what Paul's showing to us is that God has revealed, revealed to us this mysterious will of God. And what is this will of God? If you look in this verse behind me, the will of God is essentially that Jesus, through Jesus, one day everything is going to be put back the way it was designed in the beginning. One day, God is going to take everything and place it back under his uh, uh, complete authority, everything in heaven and on earth, and everything will be put back the way God designed it to be back in the garden. But what's even more mysterious about this, if you keep reading, it's that, that somehow God has decided to include you and me in this plan. It makes me wonder, like, why does God care a lick about me? Why does God, it's so mysterious that God would want to put everything back together and then care enough about little old me to include me in this plan. That's what makes it mysterious. That's what ought to make you scratch your head. Imagine if you're at an NBA game, all right, you're in the stands and they're starting to announce the starters, right? And they announce the first starter, and he comes out, and he's high-fiving everybody. And then the second guy comes out, and he's high-fiving everybody. And they're about to announce the third starter, and then they say your name. Like, wait, what? I don't know about you, but I would say it's a bit of a mystery why I would be included in this game. I'm a fan, and I don't know how to play basketball that well. Right? It would be a mis- mystery. And so Paul is saying God's will is very mysterious in that he plans to put everything back together. And for those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus, you get to be part of that. It's a mystery. So we're going to explore that together today. So here's the first fill in the blank for you this morning. 
The first thing I want you to know about the mystery of God's will is that God's will is good no matter what. God's will is good no matter what. Let me show this to you in that same three verses we just read. I'm going to underline a few things. If you look at it, again, Ephesians 1, 9 through 11, and not only has he revealed his mysterious will, but it says that it's his own good plan, and that at the right time he will bring everything together, and that he makes everything work out according to his plan. So what we see from this verse is that God has, not only does he have a plan, but it's a good plan. And that it's a plan that will work out at the, just the right time and that everything is going to work out and pan out in the end. That God has a plan and it is good. That ought to be a little mysterious to you. Like, what do you, what do you mean God's plan is good? There's been a lot of stuff that's happened in my life that I haven't felt like it was that great. I remember when I was a sophomore in high school and I found out suddenly that my mom had just died of a heart attack. It's a gut punch, right? What do you mean God has always got a good plan? That kind of was a lousy day. But here's the truth is that it doesn't matter if you had a really big mess up in your week last week, if you just really screwed things up at work. Well, God already knew that was going to happen, and he's already worked it out as part of his good plan. He's going to use that as a way he fulfills the good plan that he has. It doesn't matter if you've, uh, maybe you've gone through a divorce. Now, let let me take divorce for just a moment. I'm not picking on anyone, but I just want you to understand that there's a difference between God's perfect will and God's ultimate will. So I want you to understand the difference. God's perfect will, right? He has a plan for marriage, and that would be that two people would get married, a man and a woman would get married, and then they would stay married until one of them dies. That's his perfect will. And if his perfect will were to work itself out in every single marriage, there would be no divorce. Because God's perfect will for marriage is one man, one woman together for life. There it is. But you might be in this room and think, well, that's not the way it worked out for us. There's another thing, a part of God's will, we call God's ultimate will. And God's ultimate will recognizes that there's a bunch of us broken people. We do stupid things. We say stupid things. We think stupid things. And we're kind of part of God's plan. And because we're part of it, oftentimes we don't do things according to God's perfect will, but he still takes whatever we've done, whatever we're thinking, whatever we're saying, and he works it out for his ultimate will. God's ultimate will is good. His perfect will would be incredible, but we just can't get it together. God has a good plan, and that at the right time, he makes everything work out. You see it right there on Scripture. Maybe you've had a really hard week, something really tough happened to you in life, and you think, well, this doesn't feel very good. Well, the Scripture's really clear. God allows us to go through trial. He allows us to feel pain. He allows us to go through hard moments because he's using all those things to to ultimately fulfill his ultimate will, which is good. Sometimes I'll tell you this. God's will doesn't feel good in the moment. It might not be the way you would do things if you were in charge. But can you all just thank God for a minute that I'm not in charge, that you're not in charge? We might do things differently, but God, he knows all things, and he's good, and his plan is good. So one of the things that's mysterious about God's will that God wants to reveal to us, he says, listen, my will is good no matter what. Here's the second thing. The mystery of God's will. Number two, God's will is only accessible through Christ. There's only one way to step into the the, the, the ultimate the perfect will of God, it, it, right, is that you would be in relationship with him. But there's only one way to step into that, and it is clearly through Jesus. It's the only way. Now, I know what some people would say in this world is, Matt, that's really closed-minded. That's really bigoted. There's got to be other ways into this ultimate will of God. There's got to be other ways into relationship with Jesus. It's so close-minded and narrow-minded and bigoted to think that Jesus is the only way. But I will tell you very clearly and without apologies right here uh, on tape, as you can go back and play it as many times as you want, there's only one way to be restored in relationship to God the Father, and it is through Jesus Christ. 
And what, one of the things I, I saw when I was in India, and, and a little statistic about India. India has more people in that one country than any other country in the world. 1.4 billion people in a country that's about a third the size of the United States. And it's about four times the population of the United States. So a lot of people in India, about 85% of them practice Hinduism. And so they believe in a system, right, where uh, there's multiple gods, kind of 30,000 plus gods, and that those gods look at the way you live this life and you kind of earn good or bad karma, and that based on that karma, you're going to be reincarnated. So the life that you have right now, it's based on your karma from your previous life, according to Hinduism. And that you're put into this caste system and, and the, your lot in life is what the gods selected for you and chose for you and you need to live in it and embrace it. And so they have like this really hopeless system. It's, it's really sad to watch. And you see something like that and it's just one of those things you want to go in there and scream, listen, there's only one way to actually receive this incredible gift of salvation. And it's not by being cremated and having your ashes dumped into the Ganges River. That's not how you receive this, this freedom from this reincarnation cycle. There is no reincarnation cycle. I just wanted to scream at the top of my lungs, Jesus is the only way to be restored back to the Father. There's only one way. And Paul wants to make this really clear to the church in Ephesus, and he wants it to make it really clear to a church at 710 Aqua Heart Road in Glen Burnie. And he wants to make it so clear that he says it over and over again. Check this out. He says it in verse 3. He says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because, what? We are united with Christ. And then he says in verse 4, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault. Verse 5, it says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ. There it is again. How about verse 6? It says, so we praise God for the glorious grace that he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. There it is again. How about the next two verses? He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son. Here's the point. I don't know if you've ever encountered someone who has a really thick skull. You know what I'm talking about? Like you have to say something like three or four or five times until they actually process it and understand it and hear it. And some of you in this room, you're like, yeah, I know that person. Don't look at them right now, right? But here's the point. Paul is saying, listen, I'm gonna say the exact same thing five times. Verse after verse after verse after verse because it's important that you understand that one of the mysterious things about the will of God is that it's only accessible by putting your faith in Jesus. It's only available. His, his ultimate and his perfect will is only available by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's one of the things that we, we read about in Ephesians chapter 1. We just did verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8. All right? Here, here's the next thing I want you to know about the mystery of God's will. Is that God's will is set. God's will is set. Now this gets really mysterious theologically. This is where a lot of people d divide and create different denominational names and they let's meet in different buildings all over the place because we can't agree on the, the understanding about God's will and whether it is set or not or somewhere in between. So let me, let me explain what Ephesians wants us to know about the mystery of God's will. Let's look at verse four again. All right, so I'm, I'm pulling up some of the same verses over and over again, underlining a different part. Right here it says, even before he made the world. Even before he made the world, God had this plan. 
It's not something that he, he changed his mind about halfway through. It's not something that you, you, you did the right thing at the right moment and God was like, all right, fine. Even before he made the world, God loved you and chose you. How about this? In Ephesians 1 verse 5, the next verse, it says, God decided in advance to adopt us. This is something that had already been determined before he even spoke the, the very first words of creation. He already had a plan. He already knew he was going to create everything. He already knew we were going to screw it all up. He already knew that he wanted to restore us back to himself. He already knew he was going to send Jesus. He already knew that uh, what he wanted for you was only going to be accessible through Jesus. And he had a plan. And it was set. And it was good. I think what's hard for many people is, is the balance of how uh, in theology, as you have these conversations, we tend to get divided in things. There's, there's one side, right, which would say, well, I've been taught that we have free will, that nothing is set, that we just get to, that we, we get to decide whether or not we follow Jesus or whether we don't follow Jesus. When I leave the parking lot today, I get to decide whether or not I turn right or I turn left, right? That's kind of one end. There's another end which would lean into God's sovereignty, right? Which would say, well, according to Ephesians, God has already decided in advance to adopt certain people into sonship and to not invite other people in. So God's already decided for us. There's nothing we can do about it. God has already decided if you're gonna be a follower of Christ or you're not. He already has decided if you're turning right or left out of the parking lot. It's already decided, now, what if both of those things could be 100% true? Now, you might say, well, that doesn't make sense. That would be a mystery. Well, let me, let me show you something about trying to fully understand everything in Scripture. Isaiah 55. It says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. This is God speaking. God's thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. What I think is funny is we can see a verse like this in Scripture and then still decide and, and de be determined to understand everything about God. Like, I, I deserve to know the answer to this. Is it this or is it that? I am going to know the answer. But why can't it be that maybe some things are just higher than, than your thoughts and things that maybe your, your brain can't fully process and comprehend? Let me do the best I can to give you a word picture to try to make sense of something that we'll never fully understand this side of heaven. Remember we've talked before about the will of God and, and kind of how God is omniscient. He's outside of time and space. Uh, it's kind of like you're standing at a certain spot as a parade is going in front of you. So as a parade is crossing in front of you, you're gonna see in your moment in time exactly what's in front of you at that moment in time. You're gonna see the float that's in front of you in that moment. But God, on the other hand, he's in a helicopter over the parade. He knows what float is gonna come. He knows what float has already happened. He can see the entire parade all at once. Because listen to this, God is outside of time. You might not realize this, but God, as much as he is present at this moment in time, he is equally present right now at creation. It's kind of mind-blowing. God is outside of time. He's at creation. He's here right now. He's at, uh, when he comes and restores everything back to the way he wants it to be, he's already there. So what I mean by this is, is I believe you do get to decide whether or not you turn left or right out of the parking lot today. But God's in a helicopter. He already knows exactly what you're gonna decide. He already has it all written down. And you ready for this? He's already worked it all out for his good plan. He already knows how every decision you're going to make and every decision that anyone else is going to make, you get to make it. You get to decide whether or not you want to spend eternity in heaven with God or you want to spend eternity apart from God in a real place called hell. You get to decide that. That's a free choice. 
But God already knows what you're going to decide, and he already has it written down because he's outside of time. And so when we're looking at something saying the mystery of God's will is that it's set. God already has worked out every decision and thought and word you're ever going to say. He's already worked it out for his good purpose. That's mysterious to us. It's almost hard to comprehend. Here's the fourth thing that we learn about the mystery of God's will is that God's will is built around love for sinners. This one ought to maybe cause you to scratch your head the most. Like I understand that God is a God of love, but I don't understand why he would choose to care about me. Out of all the the eight billion people alive on this planet at this moment, why does he care how many hairs are on my head? Why does he have that number? Why does he care? And why does he have that kind of love for people who constantly reject him in our choices, in our words, in our thoughts? That's a mystery. Why does God love us endlessly? And let's go back and look at some of those verses again. Ephesians 1, 4. Not only right even before he made the world, it says, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. It's a mystery. God loves you and chooses to see you without fault. How about this? In verse 5, it says, underlined, it says, that he decided in advance to adopt you into his family. Wait, of all the people that he could adopt into his family, why would he choose me? It's a mystery. Or that is, how about this part? It says, that is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Verse 6, it says, For we praise, uh, so, so we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us. Or if we look at verses 7 and 8, it says, He is so rich in kindness and grace. He has showed, showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. There is something incredibly mysterious about the truth that while you are a sinner, God still chooses to love you. While I'm still a sinner, God still chooses to love me. One of my, my favorite things to do is to hang out with, with students, uh, middle school through high school. And there's often a debate kind of about which age group is cooler, right? Would you rather hang out with middle schoolers or high schoolers? And believe it or not, most people are sane, and they'd rather hang out with high schoolers. But I would much rather hang out with middle schoolers. Middle schoolers, if you're in this room right now and you're in middle school, man, I I feel for you because that's like the worst three years of life. It's terrible. But I love hanging out with middle schoolers. And let me tell you why I love hanging out with middle schoolers. It's pretty selfish. But when they're picking teams for dodgeball, I still get picked in the first round. (laughs) A middle schooler sees me and they're like, yeah, I want you on my team. And I'm like, yeah, you do. That's right, right? But what happens is that about three years later, they're in high school, and now they've, they've seen me play dodgeball for three years, and I don't get picked no more, right? I'm not a very athletic person. So if I were standing there in a dodgeball lineup and a high schooler was picking teams and the first round, I'm just sitting there on my phone because I know it's not going to be me. But if they did pick me, if they're like, I pick Matt, Pastor Matt, I want you on my team. I would look up. I'd look behind me. I'm like, is there another Pastor Matt here? You, you're choosing me? You're going to adopt me onto your team? Do you know how lousy I am at this game? Do you know we're likely now going to lose? I'm a huge target, and I can't jump. (laughs) Like, why would you want me on your team? And when you read verses like this, when you read a verse that says, even before he made the world, God chose Matt. When I read a verse like, God decided in advance to adopt Matt into his own family by bringing Matt to himself through Jesus Christ, even more, this is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. I don't know about you, but when you read these verses, these first few verses in Ephesians, you ought to read every single one of them and say, that's a mystery. 
Why me? Why does God love me, a sinner like that? Here's number five. The mystery of God's will. Is God's will is that all hear the gospel and believe. God's will is that all hear the gospel and believe. Now remember I was talking about there's a difference between God's perfect will and God's ultimate will. Well, this particular piece of understanding about God's will is God's perfect will. His perfect will will is that every single one of us in this room, that every single one of the 1.4 billion people alive in India right now, that every single one of them would hear the gospel and choose to accept it in faith. That's his perfect will, that every single one of you would walk out of these doors today in a relationship with Jesus. That's his perfect will. But his ultimate will allows you the freedom to decide whether or not you want to spend eternity with him or not. And so when we read Ephesians, go back to Ephesians 1. Let's look at verse 12. We haven't read that verse yet. It says, God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Jesus, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. You see what it says right there? I want you to understand the difference. When you read Scripture and you hear the word Jew and you hear the the word Gentile, what that word Gentile simply means is not Jew, right? So for those Jewish people who heard and believed, uh, you, you, you were adopted into sonship. And now you who aren't Jewish who have heard and believed, you also, but it says right here, it says, and now you Gentiles have also heard the truth the good news that God saves you. And when you believed it, right, when you entered into a relationship with Christ, at that moment, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, which he promised long ago. You see, the mystery of God's will is that he longs to, to, that every single person on this globe, every single person who has ever lived and will live in the future would hear the good news of the gospel and choose to believe it. That's his perfect will. Now we recognize that he's not going to force anybody into a relationship with him. He loves you too much. He's not going to kick his way into your house and knock the door down. He stands at the door, according to Revelation, right? And he knocks. You get to choose whether or not you accept the invitation and invite him into your life. But I want you to know that it is his perfect will that you would hear the gospel and receive it in faith. One of the things we also learn about, if it's God's will that all people would hear the gospel and believe, one of the things we know is that God doesn't want us to keep this secret. This isn't a magic trick, right, where you do the trick, and at the end, everyone's saying, you've got to tell me how you do that. And you're just like, oh, man, magician's code, I can't tell you. This isn't that kind of mystery. When people say, man, you got to tell me how God has changed your life. you got to tell me why you're, you're full of hope, why you're full of joy, why it seems like your life is just, just so full of purpose. You're like the magician with the mask on, right? Who says, let me show you the good news of the gospel. I don't want to keep this secret. In fact, I wrote down this. The mystery of the gospel is not the message itself but the implications of that message for those who believe. The mystery of the gospel isn't something that you're supposed to keep that gospel message to yourself. It's not meant to be be kept hidden as a secret. The the mystery of the gospel is not the message. The, The hard thing to understand is that those who put their faith in Jesus get to be restored back to him. That's the mystery. Why God allows that to happen and why he loves us that much. Here's the last and final thing I want you to see in Ephesians chapter 1. Is that God's will is that he be glorified through it all. 
It doesn't matter what you choose to do. It doesn't matter if you follow his perfect will or if he takes his ultimate will and works it all out. At the end of the day, Christ will be glorified. We see in Ephesians 1, verse 14, it says, The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised. So what that verse is saying right there is that when you give your life to Christ, he gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of you. It's like a wedding ring. It's like a a seal of that promise. You now have this, and it's going to it's a lock, locks in, right? The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. But then don't miss this last part. Why did he do this? He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. Will you say that underlined part with me, nice and loud? He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. Everything that God does, The fact that he sent his son to this earth to die on the cross, the fact that Jesus came back from the dead, the fact that we have access now to be restored with God the Father through faith in Jesus, the the fact that that's been made accessible, that's all accessible to you through Christ, all of that has been done with one really kind of big ultimate purpose, and it's that God be glorified. That's why God does what he does. That's why he loves you. That's why he wants a relationship with you. That's why he has love for sinners. That's why he wants all to hear the gospel. That's why he wants it to be accessible to you through Christ. That's why his will has been set before even the the world was made. That's why God's will is good. All of these things point to one thing, and it's that God be glorified in the end. So as we always do, we wrap up our messages here at ACC with a three-word prayer. And I want to invite you to say this prayer right now, wherever you are. And the prayer is simply this, what now, God? And here's why you should pray this prayer every Sunday. If you walk into this room and sit here for 70 minutes and then walk out, and you can't, you walk out the same way you walked in, I would argue that you just wasted 70 minutes of your life. But if you are intentional about saying, listen, when I corporately gather with other like-minded believers, when we open up God's word together and we study it together and we see truth in it together, that I want to make sure that every time I walk out those doors, I'm more like Jesus than when I walked in. And so you're asking God, God, what do you want me to do? What is the thing that you want me to work on, the, the change I need to make, the pattern I need to adjust? What is it you want me to do? And that's what this prayer is. And what I, want to, what I want to do is I want to read to you the last part of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Remember, these are Paul's words over the church in Ephesus. And he's talking about how he's praying for them to use this information that he just shared with them. And so if you do me a favor, would you bow your heads right where you're at? I'm going to pray a prayer, but really I'm going to read scripture over you in the form of a prayer. And I just want you to listen to these words. Ephesians 1, verse 15 to 23. Paul says, Ever since I have heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those that he called, his holy people who who are his rich and glorious inheritance. And Paul says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. And God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church, you all, right? This is his body. 
It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Father, right now, we're a church that is so thankful that you choose to reveal more about yourself through your word. I pray that we would be a church that is constantly maturing in our understanding of you, that things that seem mysterious to us today will be less mysterious to us tomorrow. God, we are thankful for the things that you choose to reveal to us. We recognize that on this side of heaven, we're never going to understand fully the way you think and all the things that you do. But we can stand on the truths that we learned today. God, we can stand on the truth that your will is good, that your, your will is, is for us to be able to be restored into relationship to you through Christ. God, we recognize that your will has already been set. You already know the, the free decisions that we're going to make, and you've already worked those things out for your glory. God, we love you and, and thank you that you choose to love us while we're still sinners. And God, help us get the good news of the gospel out to everyone in this world and that when they hear it, God, they would accept it in faith and that ultimately you would be glorified through it all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.